the need to have yourself heard and to influence this inchoate thing called a TV show, when it's so personal, it engenders a lot of feeling. And there were a lot of feelings attached to it. Everyone's experience of high school is unique and authoritative. And when it differs from someone else's, that was a source of something conflictual sometimes. Most of the things that depicted adolescence, I think, were fundamentally exploitative in some way. It was about only about sexuality, titillation, that sort of thing. And to try to come from the inside of the experience was, was something that you just weren't seeing on television. So I had already attempted that from a boy's point of view, and I also had had a thought about doing a series based on a girl's diary, and where you would see that her diary was not accurate. In other words, her perceptions of what she saw were not necessarily accurate. Um, so I had all these ideas floating around in my head, and we sat down with Winnie just to talk about what kind of a series we could do together, because we loved her and we loved our experience working with her on 30-something. Marshall and Ed had a philosophy that they were bringing to TV that we were all influenced by. One of the elements was make television personal. Make it about, make it something you actually have to say. I think the first thing she did was actually write some voiceover. She just wrote in the voice of a girl. And it wasn't scenes or anything like that. We didn't have a story. She just started writing this girl's observations. What was really clear from the beginning, once Winnie began writing in that voice, in those first, you know, exploratory uh, monologues that she was just writing without shape, or without form, that there was no question but that this girl uh, existed within her. I started to write these little diary entries and I sent, I remember I gave them to him and, and he was just, he was like, this is, this is it, this is the series. And I started to find in there her voice and uh, what I wanted to explore. The thought that I might be seeing Jordan Catalano in a few hours was like impossible to comprehend. Like when they first tell you about infinity. I was empowered by them to, to write you know, right from my heart to to write um, in a way that was that expressed some th things I really thought about, and and not to create what I thought TV executives wanted. It was actually the opposite to kind of just create f what I wanted. Do you have anything to drink or anything? You drink? Why not? Why shouldn't I? I don't know. Why? Because I'm too innocent. No. I'm sick of being like that. Well, I'm... Angela. What? I'm just... Why? Is there something really wrong with me? No. A television series, in my view, is a living thing. It's not an hour episode or a two-hour movie. It, it, it's, it's many times a 20-hour arc. It's like a repertory theater in which you are doing, in this case, you know, a different play every week. And obviously every episodic television show has that. Uh, I just felt in this one it was experienced even more intensely than most. 30-something certainly had a similar kind of effect, but it was people who were more grown up and they loved the show and they felt like it was about them and they had a warm feeling about it. But my so-called life had a sense of a formative influence on people. People used to say it was, a sh it was you know, a, t a show about teenagers. I, it was to some extent, but I really thought of it as a show about people where the theme was being a teenager. The experiences that, ex that we have in high school, I don't care if you went to high school in the 40s or, or in, in 2007, they mark you for the rest of your life. The events that happen, happen over and over. It's not specific to any one generation that maturation into adulthood, it's the same. And we are playing that same game as adults today. I cannot bring myself to eat a well-balanced meal in front of my mother. It just means too much to her. We always felt that this show would appeal to everyone. Um, we felt because everyone either wants to be a teenager, is a teenager, or was a teenager, and those years are so powerful and evocative. You know, nobody forgets what they were like in high school. That moment in life is always radioactive for everybody. My biggest fear, probably at that time, the whole time I was writing it, was to sound fake 
or to sound like I was looking down on a teenager rather than embodying one. They're like normal. They're like us. I was brought in to direct the uh, pilot, but when I say direct the pilot, that means to work with Winnie, to really try and understand her point of view of, uh, of this material, and that's what I, I did. I mean, I jumped in with both feet and tried to understand what it was like to be a 15-year-old girl. A close friend of ours who's a wonderful casting director had been in New York, and we asked her, is there anyone in New York we should look at who's this age? And she said, yes, there are two people you should look at. Uh, there's this beautiful young girl named Alicia Silverstone, and there's this complete unknown named Claire Danes, who'd done like one episode of A Law and Order. And so Alicia came in first, and I think she was 16 at the time, but she was emancipated, which means that she had finished high school and she could work as an adult, which would make our lives much easier from a scheduling standpoint. And I remember someone in the room saying, we need someone who's beautiful one moment and then the next moment just looks like a regular girl and kind of goes back and forth between beautiful and not beautiful. And then in walks Claire Danes, who at that moment in her life sort of was that in some way. And, you know, she was magical. There was no logical reason to hire this girl. She's in every scene, and yet she can only be in front of the camera five hours a day. Ed and I, who rarely fight, got into a big fight because um, he said, we can't use her, she's 13, you can't shoot the show. And I said, there is no show without that girl. That girl is just incredible. And in the room, we decided that the only solution to that was to actually do more stories about the grown-ups and more stories about the ensemble and to take it away from being 100% focused on the inner life of this girl. I think a, a, a television show, if you're, if you're really paying attention as a creator, is organic. I think it tells you what it wants to be. In this case, the, the um, arithmetic of the number of hours and the, and the obligation to spread out the cast created more of an ensemble feel than we might have first imagined, but look at the, at, at, at the wonders that we discovered. When we wrapped the pilot, you know, showed it to ABC, and um, ABC was ba basically had the reaction of, we don't know. In other words, we didn't get the way people just got announced in May, like they're on the air. We didn't get that. We got, well, we don't know. So that's one of the reasons it took so long to go back into production. They basically killed us in dribs and drabs. I mean, we ended up doing 19 episodes, and I think it took us literally two and a half years from the time we did the pilot to when we did the final episode. It was, it was painful. found Jason Kadams through reading, an, I think it was an 11-page play. I grew up in New York and I was writing plays and trying to support myself and I had a job working on computers and uh, I got a message one day on my phone machine from Ed Zwick's office. I called him up and he got, you know, assistant puts me through and he gets on the line and he said, hi. I said, hi. And he said, I just want to let you know, let, let you know I read a play of yours and I really liked it and I said, um, thanks. And he said, by the way, do you know who I am? And I said, no, no, I'm sorry, I don't. And he said, well, just by way of resume, I, I directed a movie called Glory, and I created this show called 30-something, and I said, I, I think you could stop there. He was really, really a great source of strength to me, and he just, he understood what we were doing, and he fit it in perfectly. Because this was Winnie's first time, and because she was trying to do something very specific, the writing of that show was very demanding and it just took up all of her time. It's impossible for most people to write that much, that fast, that quickly. Um, it, you know, the, the demands of, of writing television are, are so intense. And I think it was too much to ask of her at that moment in her sort of development as a television producer to be doing all of that and be on the set and guide what was going on on the set. You know, there was a sense of urgency when I was writing it. I would always be behind <laughs> and have to write quickly. I ended up spending a lot of time on that production, physically being there, sort of trying to keep things on track because I just wanted it to be great. What was great about the show is the specificity of voice in every single character and how, you know, Winnie just kind of knew these people. I can't believe she's this mad. I know, but see, I can see it from your side, but I also see it from her side and from my own side. <laughs> I don't really have a side. 
the genius of my so-called life is that I know, I remember while we were making it, Winnie would get these letters from people saying, how do you know this about my life, you know? I mean, because it's so, it's so familiar. It's so, it touches every nerve every one of us had in high school that, that you get it. I mean, it feels like she's listening to your secret thoughts or you're, she's reading your diary. When we were casting the pilot, I got such incredible feedback from the young actors that were coming in saying that they found it very authentic. And that's really all I, that's really all I needed to hear. You know, the karma in this house is like ridiculous. Really? Yeah, it's really low, dark. I didn't think of these kids as kids. I would find myself sitting on the curb with Claire Danes in Pasadena talking to this very, very old soul, 13 year old. And forgetting that she was 13, I, I, I couldn't see her as anything but my peer. Claire would literally be plucked out of her French class, you know, run down to the set, do an amazingly hard emotional moment perfectly in one take, and, you know, just go back to French class. I mean, that's who we were dealing with. Uh, we were dealing with a really unusual level of talent. I went up to her and said, oh, this scene is about, is about you and Jordan and blah, blah, blah. I think it was the scene at the car. And Claire went, oh, yeah, she was being nice. She just said, oh, yeah, and it's about that. But it's also about this and this and this and this and that. And it was like a million threads of character dynamics and how characters are interwoven. And she got them all. You know, you don't really need to direct Claire. You don't really want to direct Claire. Claire knows what she needs to do. And she really identified with the character. She and the character had become one. So how can I... Mm, 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 mm. Quit it! I mean, you have to work up to that. Because Claire was such an astounding actress, it gave me the freedom to go, to relax, and to not have to ever worry. Well, can I write, can I write a scene like this? Can I have her doing this? I mean, it made me very inspired which is exactly what you, of course, want as a writer with any actor that you work with. Every one of the actors on the show was, was stretching. Uh, you take Devin Odessa, was always, always played bad girls, and she was cast as, as so, the, the good girl. So tell me what I did, Angela. I mean, I mean, I would really like to know. The parents were still caught in their teenage identities, trying to figure out what those even meant anymore. Oh. I know, it, it, it's infuriating. And she's got this really loud, obnoxious car. Of course, it won't start in the cold. And so I look under the hood. You looked under Hallie Lowenthal's hood? You know, the parents were trying to figure out who they even were. We always felt that the adult uh, roles were as relevant as the kid roles. Angela's parents, many times, their conflicts and storylines paralleled events that were happening in the kids' lives. You know, sometimes I think that I partly married you because I knew that you'd be a really good father. Wilson Cruz's character was um, uh, a unique character in television at the moment this series was made. One, he was sort of, you know, he wore eye makeup, you know, he was just sexually ambiguous. The time, you know, to write about a teenage gay character struggling with his sexuality and sort of coming out and all that, it was different than it would be today. I mean, it was really new and it was really kind of challenging, you know, to put that out there like that in such a real way. Interestingly, I, I literally wrote in the script, he's half black, half Latino, because I didn't want him to be either one thing or another. I wanted him to be hard to pin down. And Wilson Cruz walks in, he's, he's half uh, Puerto Rican, you know, he's half African American, he's the part. All they had was barbecue, I hope that's okay. It's fine. I'm in love. His name is Jordan Catalano. Jared wasn't supposed to come back. Jared's character was just written for the pilot. You know, it seems impossible now to picture the show without him, but when we saw him, in the pilot, we wanted him for as much as we were going to do. I, I, I instantly wanted that character to continue. Jared Leto showed us how relevant 
Jordan Catalano was. We didn't know that until we saw Jared Leto perform it. You can think what you want about me. I never lied. I learned through working with Ed Zwick and Marsha Herskovitz that film language matters. And that, uh, not that I approach it the same way. Frankly, what was great is that Ed and Marshall, who are both directors, uh, respected the fact that I actually see things differently than they do. We wanted directors to bring in their own styles. There were things we learned from directors. As long as they understood the general sense of what we wanted that show to accomplish. My so-called life was very director friendly. In my episode in Life of Brian, um, we were for the we were for the first time going to you know call it by its name or at least you know call it you know visually by what it was. So see you Saturday, right? Excuse me. Rayanne said the three of us are going to hang together at the dance and actually see who he's looking at and why, and not just imply he's different, but show that his, you know, he really is attracted to other guys. You know, and that was very exciting to me. The one thing that sort of it was a little bit kind of was different was um, Life of Brian, where we changed the point of view to Brian Krakow's voiceover. At Angela's house, they probably like laugh and eat unbalanced meals and talk about things that don't have deep symbolic meaning. That episode was a real joy for me because to me that one was kind of a little bit more, I was creating that voice. These are easy episodes to direct, I have to tell you. You don't have to work on subtext with the actors. When he's all subtext all the time, it's all there. I'm missing Rayanne's party because... Who's Rayanne? My best friend. You're missing your best friend's party. Bess's character was being this tight ass, over grinning, smiling, tense person, but she was ultimately protecting her daughter. Go do your thing, as they say. Mom, why does she have to stick around here when she's got better plans? What about family? What about doing what's right? Bowie. Doing what's right? We're having a party for someone who isn't here. I'm a big uh, believer in a certain continuity of film language and I feel that sometimes on television, we use a more uh, elliptical approach, a modular approach. My so-called life comes from an era where television was, in, its, in a weird way, a little more cinematic, and then it sat back and let two people exist in a frame, as opposed to always being in close-ups. My brother shot the first, I think, 10 episodes, and he is just a real, a really incredible cinematographer. He found a way to give it a, a look of a film, I think, and um, all of us, all of us were, that was all of our aim. But we didn't even, it was so much our aim, we didn't even talk about it that much. Ed and Marshall and Winnie and myself, we all were under this delusion that we weren't making a show for kids. We couldn't understand why they weren't uh, programming it at 10 o'clock. Networks did not understand that you could sell to adolescent girls. Advertisers did not understand that you could sell to adolescent girls. They didn't care about them. They were a, they, a sort of a, a, an invisible demographic to the networks. Networks always trying to narrow the demographic. I don't believe that a, a show that features a high school uh, point of view or teenagers as the center should only be for teenagers. Angela, listen to me. You are not going back to that place. This is a serious matter. I know that. Why do you speak like this to me, like I'm a child? This girl, whoever she is, has serious problems. You haven't even talked to her. I've talked to her. This girl, she could be me. Oh, don't say that. We had conversations with, with people at the network and told them as passionately as we could that what they had here was a resource that they should not squander. They liked it very much, but they felt they couldn't sell it, and they, the advertisers weren't that interested in it. For a show that only had 18 episodes, it's had a huge effect on an entire generation. They who canceled the show, even anecdotally, knew the passions of those uh, had for it. Whether they were going to renew it or not, I guarantee you it would have been for another four episodes or five episodes. It would have been a, it would have been a continuation of this slow death. And so 
there was finally something of a relief, even though we were so disappointed, just to know that we didn't have to be in this state of limbo anymore. He just stands there, like someone caught in a storm who stopped caring how what he gets. Then I wake up. MTV made the best deal for MTV in the history of deals. They went to ABC Productions. We, we didn't own the show, ABC owned the show, and said to them, we'll give you X amount of dollars for an unlimited series of runs. And ABC Productions at that moment thought that, I guess, you know, a few dollars was better than no dollars and said yes. And it turned out that MTV meant what they said. They ran it. Um, it was, it was sort of my so-called life all the time. I, they must run it several times a day for several years. I think the, the play on MTV was remarkable. And I think in some way it solidified something that was just beginning to happen on ABC. And I think a whole new group of girls discovered the show who hadn't even seen the show before it was on MTV. I remember once reading um, some description of, of, of what is a classic. A classic is just something that people continue to enjoy long after it first comes out, and they enjoy it as if it's new. This show is the James Dean of television shows. You know, it died young, and because it died young, it was all potential in some way, and there was something pure about those 19 episodes, and people could hold on to them and imbue them with their own fantasy and their own sort of legend about it. And, and who knows, maybe it's better that way. It probably the most, uh, uh, most creatively satisfying piece of film I've ever shot. I've always had a great soft spot for my so-called life. I personally love the cast, love the crew, love the whole creative team. It was just a joyful, positive working in situation. I adored the show. I really adored the show. It was just uh, a thrill to work. It was a privileged time for everybody working on the show. Institutions have never been the best judge of, of art, particularly in its moment. They're utterly happy to, to honor it after the fact and, and when it's been you know, burnished by uh, you know, uh, time. Time itself is what finally judges anything. And the notion that this small little thing seems to have endured or kept its luster after this long is reward far beyond even, you know, a pickup. It meant that it had some traction. I, you know, I couldn't have asked for more. I could never have asked for more than my so-called life, what it furnished. It, it, it reached people um, all over the world. And, you know, it, it pleased who it pleased and interested who it interested. And I, I could, I'm extremely pr proud of it. And I don't have any wish that it be, have have played out any differently. Uh, none.